What's up, everybody? I'm the Goju Ryu Philosopher, but this video is actually going to be a little bit of a departure from my focus on Goju. About a month ago, uh, that is when I sat down to write this script, so probably about a month and a half, maybe two months ago by the time I released this, one of my older videos, which isn't really my best work, but that I'm still relatively proud of, experienced a massive jump in views, which makes it now the second most viewed video on my channel, which, uh, thank you guys. That video is called What Happened to Good Karate, and in it I made a few arguments that, looking back I feel still pretty much hold up, as to why karate has gone from being an incredibly effective martial art to something that's laughably ineffective, at least in the vast majority of dojos that teach karate nowadays. Now, obviously I wouldn't be practicing karate or making these videos if I felt that it was completely useless, but it is obvious that there has been a certain loss of proficiency in technique, especially in terms of combat effectiveness, and especially when you look at the dojos that teach WKF-style point sparring as their main form of kumite. Looking back, the only thing that I really wish that I'd clarified in that video was that when I said that 95% of karate was useless, what I'm referring to is the fact that a lot of dojos, especially those that teach the more popular styles like Shotokan, Uechi Ryu, and yes, even Goju Ryu, have mostly discarded their combat effectiveness during their sportization process. Now, if your goal is to learn karate for physical education or good exercise, or for the sports aspect of it, then there's absolutely no problem with that. My only real problem with this movement away from combat effectiveness is when these dojos promote their styles as being effective in self-defense without actually being able to back that up in fights that have actual contact in them. But the overrepresentation of sport karate, especially in those styles that have become popular in the US, Britain, and other Western countries, has led a lot of other martial artists to devalue karate's combat effectiveness. And, like a lot of karateka who want their style to be actually effective in combat, what that means is that I want to seek out that 5% that actually works, and help make it more well-known, more famous, and more widespread. So, back to what happened to good karate. I noticed a couple of comments, and more importantly, some videos that my video was suggested on where a lot of my extra views came from, that were talking about people who've found a style that still does teach combat effective karate. This interested me, because Goju Ryu, my style, may still have a few strains that teach in an effective way, but has largely been subsumed into the sportization process that has claimed other effective karate, so attempting to make it effective requires going back to old methodologies like an archaeologist. But this style, Motobu Ryu, never lost its mojo and remains one of the most effective karate styles out there. Or at least, so the claim goes. In fact, it would seem like Motobu Ryu and its famous founder Motobu Choki are somewhat of a trending topic in karate YouTube right about now. Both Jesse Enkamp and Karate Dojo Waku, two channels that I admire and absolutely adore, have recently made some videos on him where they call him the greatest karate fighter ever. Additionally, most of my extra views on my video came from another video by Kenfu TV, which is a little bit older but seems to have experienced a jump in popularity around the same time. Now, I may be a bit late to covering Motobu Choki, but I figured that I'd take a look into Motobu Ryu and see what all the fuss is about. I mean, hell, I myself have used him as an example in a couple of videos, most recently in the pair of videos that were comparing judo to karate that should have come out right before this one. So let's take a look at this greatest karate fighter of all time. Uh, we've got Google open, we're gonna search Motobu Ryu. Uh, ignore this first one because it's a Wikipedia page. Uh, I was always taught not to cite Wikipedia as a source. This next one says karate do preschool. Looks interesting, but you know, maybe not what I'm looking for. Ah, here's one that looks interesting, uh, motoburyu.org. That's probably it. Let's click on that. And, huh. Well, that's not Motobu Choki. All right, let's uh, go to home. Have I got the wrong style? No. Nope. Yeah, so it looks like Motobu Choki is this guy right here. So who's this guy over here? That was, of course, a dramatic recreation. Even since before everyone started making videos about Motobu Choki, I'd already heard of his older brother Choyu, as well as his martial art of Udundi. The Motobu family were members of the Shizoku aristocracy in the Ryukyu kingdoms, and their family had long passed down the royal martial arts style of Udundi, which literally means the K of the palace. However, this royal martial art was only passed down from the head of the family to the eldest son, which is why the younger brother Choki had to get his education primarily in Todi, the Chinese-derived martial arts traditions that were popular among the lower-ranked aristocracy as well as the wealthier merchants, and which have now become known as karate. 
The current successor to Motobu Choki's style of karate is his son, Motobu Chose, who, through a little bit of a twist of fate, has also become the inheritor of his uncle's martial art, Motobu Udundi. So Motobu Ryu, at least nowadays, doesn't just refer to the no-nonsense karate style of Motobu Choki, but also to the martial arts of his older brother, both of which have been passed down but not mixed together by the same man. And while Choki may be known as the greatest karate fighter, it's said that when he matched his style against his brother's Udundi, he got thrown around like a ragdoll. So this is The Tale of Two Motobus, how their styles both managed to get passed down to the same person, and of course, which of these two pioneers really deserves the title of greatest karate fighter ever. Let's get into it. Okay, so to really explain the history of the Motobu family and their martial arts, first I have to make a brief foray into discussing the aristocracy of the Ryukyu kingdoms. Before being officially annexed into Japan in 1879, the Ryukyu kingdoms, governed from the largest island of Okinawa, had a system of aristocrats who primarily served the bureaucratic and security functions for the kingdom. Most of these officials were called yukachu, which literally means good people, although in some cases the loan word samure was also used to describe people of this class. Above these ranks in the hierarchy were, naturally, the king from the Sho dynasty, as well as royal counselors and advisors, who were outside of the caste system, and who had the ability to either raise or lower a person's standing in the class system based on the quality of their service, even occasionally being able to induct commoners into the aristocracy. However, above even the counselors, there was a special rank that was reserved solely for branch families of the Sho dynasty, the descendants of the second or third sons of kings, who played a vital role in the court, known as the Aji, and the Motobu family, descended from the sixth son of the tenth king of the Sho dynasty, was one such Aji family. The title of Udun, referring to the palace where the royal family lived, signified the Motobu family's blood relation to the king, and several generations of the Motobu family served incredibly important roles at court, including the fourth head of the Motobu family, who was granted the title of Oji, or prince, in recognition of his service to the kings, as was the seventh. Several members of the Motobu family were renowned for their martial arts skill, and the style of Udundi is even said to have been passed down since the family first split off from the royal line in 1666. However, like the succession of the head of the family, as well as the title of Aji, this martial art was only passed down from the father to his eldest son. As a unique style of fighting that included both weapons and weaponless techniques, its secrets were closely guarded, even from other aristocratic families. Several members of the Motobu family served as personal instructors in the martial arts to the royal family, joining some of the other giants of karate's pre-modern history like Todi Sakugawa and Matsumura Sokon, the latter of whom was also a personal instructor to both of the Motobus whose styles have been passed down to our generation. This unparalleled access to the most accomplished martial arts in all of Ryukyu, including those that came from China, those that came from the Satsuma domain in Japan, as well as, of course, those that were cultivated by ten generations of royalty, explains why the Motobu family, as well as some of its branch families, have had such an incredibly large influence in the Okinawan martial arts. It's important to note that, while Udundi was only passed to the future heads of the family, many other members of the Motobu clan studied a variety of different martial arts. For instance, the Kyan family, best known for Kyan Shotoku and his monumental impact on karate, was originally known as the Motonaga family, which had branched off of the Motobu line from its sixth head, Motobu Aji Chokyu. After ten generations, the Motobu family would welcome three new sons into their lineage, the eldest, Choyu, being born in 1857, and the youngest, Choki, in 1870. Though they would both grow up in the same household and learn from many of the same teachers, these two brothers would take incredibly different paths with their martial arts, one carrying on the torch of the family style, and the other setting off on his own path and changing the world of karate forever. Both of these brothers studied with Matsumura Sokon and Matsumura Kosaku, alongside their friend Yabu Kensu. However, because of Choyu's head start and his training in the family style, Choki, not wanting to be outdone, sought out additional instruction from other Todi masters in order to help bridge the gap. This is also when he famously went to the red light district of Tsujimachi in Naha and got involved in Kakedameshi, real life street fights where he would test out the fighting principles that he and Yabu were both learning. Even after the abolition of the Ryukyuan monarchy, 
For a member of an Aji family to be seen in the red light district, where the common trade was prostitution, was already an incredible shock to the social order. And getting into public street fights was even worse for his social position. The only thing that could have possibly made the situation worse for Choki would be if he were to lose one of these fights. But, as we all know, he never lost one of these fights. Choyu, on the other hand, fastidiously held up the expectations of his royal lineage even after the monarchy no longer existed. Motobu Choyu is said to have continued to wear his hair long, in the style of Ryukyuan aristocracy, and with a gold hairpin to signify his status, for his entire life. He also continued to cultivate himself in the literary and artistic traditions that were the sole domain of the upper classes in the pre-Meiji structure, such as Ryukyuan dance and poetry. Furthermore, he continued the tradition of horse riding that was one of the peculiarities of the royal armed martial arts, and stemmed from the Japanese tradition of the cavalry serving an important battlefield role. Motobu Choki eventually moved to Osaka, hoping to make a living in the mainland of Japan. At the same time, however, his older brother had begun to take on students, the most notable of which was Uehara Seikichi, a young boy from a commoner's family whose family business of manufacturing soy and miso was stable, but not prosperous enough to buy the chance that other Okinawans like Miyagi Chojun had at receiving a traditional martial arts education. However, Choyu took a liking to him and began to teach him, and by the relatively young age of 18, Uehara was already advanced enough to assist in teaching his master's son, Motobu Chomo. When Choki moved to Osaka, he had an incredible difficulty promoting his karate there. However, back in Okinawa, Choyu was finding immense success. In around 1923, Motobu Choyu founded the Okinawa Karate Research Club, with Miyagi Chojun and Mabuni Kenwa serving as its instructors. Many famous karateka passed through these halls, including Choki sometime later, and this club, known informally as Club Gua, represented the first real serious collaboration between the various strains of martial arts and karate that were being practiced at that time. Motobu Choyu gave personal instruction to every student and master to pass through the club, and is probably the reason why the understanding of pre-sport kumite, which hadn't existed in a systematized form outside of Udundi prior to that, has survived at all. But by this point in his life, he was already of an incredibly advanced age. Concurrently, his younger brother Choki was trying to gain a foothold in Osaka. This is when he famously encountered an advertisement for the judo versus boxing bout that was being held in Kyoto, not too far away from him. After watching that bout, where he judged the boxer's movements to be slow and sluggish, he applied to challenge the boxer the very next day, at the same time placing a bet on himself. This is his own recounting of the story, so obviously it should be taken with a grain of salt, but he recalls having entered with no gloves and while being much shorter than his opponent, and that the boxer didn't really take him seriously throughout the first round. However, this was, he asserts, because he was only really trying to feel out his opponent for the duration of that first round. During the second round, though, he felt that it would be a dishonor to his family and to karate, not to mention to Okinawa as a whole, if he were to lose, so he struck the boxer as hard as he could right in the temple, knocking him out. This story quickly became famous and helped immensely at spreading karate across mainland Japan, but the newspaper reporting on this fight infuriated Choki for two different reasons. The first was that, although he recalls having struck his opponent with a closed fist, it was so fast that the reporters believed that he had finished him with an open hand. And the second was that the newspaper's illustrations showed Funakoshi Gichin, who had been having considerably more success at popularizing his karate as having been the man who took down the foreign boxer. Choki and Funakoshi would quarrel for the rest of their days, with Funakoshi famously saying that Motobu Choki was an illiterate, a common myth about him that surprisingly still persists to this day. In truth, of course, Choki could read and write incredibly well, as would have been expected of him as a member of an Aji family, and his refusal to assimilate into mainland Japanese society, as well as to speak and write in mainland Japanese standard language, was more in protest over Ryukyu's annexation than anything else. Soon after this incident, Choki published the first of his two books, Compilations of Okinawa Kempo Karate Jutsu Kumite. Choyu had already achieved an advanced age by the time the Karate Research Club began, but he remained very active and lively throughout this entire time, participating in several embu, performances of his martial arts. However, he adamantly refused to perform any of the techniques of His Majesty's martial art, Udundi, instead performing techniques from karate which were already widely available. His main student, Uehara Seikichi, was tasked to pass on what he had learned to Choyu's son, 
but also frequently took part in these embu himself. Tragically, in 1928, while returning from a performance that he had given alongside his younger brother Choki, Motobu Choyu fell ill and eventually passed away. With Choyu's passing, the Karate Research Club was officially disbanded, but the collaboration that he had helped to foster between many different styles and practitioners would continue on for many decades afterwards. Uehara Seikichi, having passed control of Motobu Udundi back to Motobu Chomo, would eventually move to the Philippines, where he would start a small dojo and continue his training. Choki, at this point, moved to Tokyo and began to teach at Toyo University, eventually founding his own school, the Daidokan, at some unknown point before 1930. He published his most famous book, Mai Karate Jutsu, in 1932, which, as an historical document, provides us with an invaluable look into the names and styles of karate with which he had contact, as well as into the forgotten history of karate, as well as memorializing several karateka whose names and accomplishments would otherwise have gone forgotten. He continued to be involved with the development of karate for the next decade and a half, participating in the Karate Masters Symposium, continuing his research, and training many karateka, including his son Chose. Very famously, he was one of the loudest voices criticizing alterations in kata and the invention of a new, more Japanized style of kumite that has annoyed karate traditionalists and purists for almost 90 years now. When he was 72, Choki would return to Okinawa in what was originally intended to be a brief visit to home. However, Okinawa was to be one of the first targets hit by American retaliation for the attack on Pearl Harbor, and Choki was unable to return to Osaka due to the war situation. He would live out the rest of his days in Okinawa, passing away just shortly before the worst days of the war, on the 15th of April, 1944. He was said to have said of the war situation, shortly before he passed, that it was almost impossible to win, an assessment that was as no-nonsense as the man himself. So, what are the differences between Motobu Choki's karate and Motobu Choyu's udundi? Well, in large part, the differences between them can be found in the prefixes to the character of te or di. Karate, of course, is a modern pronunciation of what in the Okinawan language would have been pronounced to di, a phrase which is composed of the character for the Tang Dynasty, which would come to represent China in a more broad sense, and the character for hand. This is why Mario McKenna translated the title of Itoman Morinobu's book as the study of China hand techniques. While the full extent of the cross-pollination between Todi and Chinese martial arts is up for debate, and there was definitely a huge influence on Todi from indigenous Okinawan martial arts, generally speaking, the techniques and training methodology of Todi are Chinese. Udundi, on the other hand, is the hand techniques of the palace, a set of techniques and training methods that were indigenous to the royal family of the Ryukyu kingdoms. While it would be reasonable to assume that some of their methods were affected by the kingdom's trade and political relationships with China and Japan, on the whole, their unique methodologies seem to have been largely insulated from outside influence. The Motobu family did often invite Todi masters to teach them, and no doubt added some of their training methodologies into their personal practice, but the separation was still strong enough to make Udundi a completely different martial art than any of the styles of karate that we know today. Motobu Udundi uses a relatively unique style of standing called Tachugwa, a straight-legged stance with the heels slightly lifted and weight placed over the balls of the feet. On the other hand, Motobu Kempo uses the Naihanshi Dachi stance, this stance right here. Both styles make use of the front and rear hands and feet in order to strike, something that, according to the current Motobu Ryu organization, was unique to their styles pre-war. They also both make use of a kamae kata, or way of holding the hands in preparation for fighting, called me otode, literally meaning husband and wife hands. In this kamae, the rear hand is held not in a hikite posture, but rather extended out by the elbow of the lead hand, in a posture not dissimilar to old photos of boxers. Both styles also use the idea of attacking and defending at the same time, only including blocks that were originally meant to be redirections or grabs, as well as those that could be instantly transitioned into a striking technique. It's been said that Motobu Choki only knew one kata, Naihanchi Shodan. This is almost certainly not the case, as he's known to have taught Pasai and Seisan, and may have even had, and in fact, given his impressive array of teachers, almost certainly had, knowledge of well more kata than even these. However, he did base the entirety of his practice and teaching off of Naihanchi Shodan, which he claims includes all of the techniques and principles of his style. 
Cho Yu, on the other hand, is said to have known more than 30 kata, but like his younger brother, his udundi places very little emphasis on fixed forms. Instead, he based his practice on motode, a conditioning exercise a lot like sanchin or kensho, which, like those kata, was originally not even a fixed form. Both styles also place a large focus on free sparring, which is called kumite in motobu kenpo and sotai dosa in udundi. Motobu udundi also contains a lot of techniques that are absent not just in motobu kenpo, but also in any other style of karate. One of these types of techniques is tuiti, a throwing and joint locking technique that is said to be somewhat similar to aiki jujitsu. These techniques were predominantly trained in free sparring, as well as some of the traditional dances that were performed at court. Udundi was also one of the only martial traditions to make extensive use of weapons, a rite traditionally reserved for the royal family and its cadets. And in addition to the many weapons that are found in karate styles and their related kobudo styles, they were also permitted to train in kenjutsu, sojutsu, kyujutsu, and naginara jutsu. That is to say, swords, spears, bow and arrows, and the naginata. Many of these weapons are very similar to how they're treated in Japanese kodu martial arts, but their designs are often heavily influenced by Chinese weapons, and of course, many of their uses are significantly different from their Japanese equivalents, owing to a variety of reasons too broad and diverse to get into within this video. Motobu Kenpo may already be significantly different than many other styles of karate, both in its focus on sparring and elimination of almost all kata, as well as its use of the me otode kamae, but Motobu Udundi is even more of a foreign concept to karate than Motobu Kenpo is. Over time, a few karate influences have worked their way into Udundi, including in the creation of several training kata called Kashindi, but overall, Motobu Udundi is unlike anything you've ever seen before. And that's why it almost didn't survive. Uehara Sekichi, Motobu Choyu's student, had passed the style back into the family, but during the Second World War, something terrible happened. In 1945, Choyu's son Chomo, the 13th head of Motobu Udundi, was killed during the chaos of wartime. Uehara himself was actually drafted as a military auxiliary in the Philippines, where he'd been living for more than a decade prior to the war, and this would put him into some of the most brutal and humiliating battles fought by the Japanese army, but his fortune was greater than his students, and all of a sudden, Motobu Udundi was left without a successor. After the war, in 1947, Uehara would return to Okinawa, where he would eventually establish a dojo in Ginowan in 1951. He taught at this dojo for many, many years, and would eventually name his style, as you should be aware by now, Motobu Ryu, in honor of his teacher. Although he had been gone from Okinawa for more than 20 years, Uehara would eventually attract the attention of the martial arts world, and he would be able to teach and trade tips with many karateka and other martial artists, including an infamous seminar with the Hakko Ryu style of Koryu Jujutsu. I say infamous, of course, because this seminar has caused several people to speculate that the Tuiti techniques of Udundi weren't actually part of the original curriculum, but were rather added in from Hakko Ryu. This is highly unlikely to have actually been the case, but it reflected the karate community's occasional animus towards Uehara and his Udundi as being not really karate, which technically was true. Worrying that the Motobu family's style would die with him, Uehara-sensei eventually opened Udundi to the public, turning the secret martial art of kings into a public style which anyone could train. However, he continued to search for a way to return the style to where he believed it truly ought to be, with the Motobu family. Uehara contributed very heavily to the research of Okinawan culture and traditional court dances, as well as to the many organizations that succeeded the Karate Research Club in promoting cross-style communication between Okinawan martial artists. But it wouldn't be until 1976, when he was 72 years old, that he would be able to fulfill his goal when he would perform in Kobe in front of his teacher's nephew, Motobu Chose. Chose, Motobu Choki's second son and the only son of his to have survived the war, had already inherited his father's karate style, which he officially calls Nihon Denryu Heiho Motobu Kenpo. But when Uehara let him know of his desire to return Udundi to the Motobu family, he became a new student once again. Luckily for him and for us, Uehara-sensei had many more years left in him, continuing to train and perform and research up until almost the very end. At the celebration of his 99th birthday, held on the 17th of August 2003, 
he officially designated Motobu Chose as the head of Motobu Udundi. Uehara passed away in April of 2004 at the age of 100, having fulfilled his life's dream. So nowadays, Motobu Ryu, both the karate style and Udundi, are headed by Motobu Chose, who carries on the traditions of both, but keeps them separated from one another to preserve the history and the uniqueness of each style. Chose is getting to be nearly 100 himself, having been born in 1925, and his two sons Tomoyuki and Naoki are both accomplished martial artists, no doubt ready and willing to carry on the family legacy for years to come. But of course, there's one last thing that I need to mention before I wrap this video up, which is of course, which of the Motobu brothers was really the greatest karate fighter ever? Well, obviously it's Motobu Choki. Why is that? Because Choyu's art was udundi, not karate. In all seriousness though, it's likely that Choyu was the better fighter, although we can't really be certain of that unless someone builds a time machine. On one hand, Choyu threw his younger brother around every time that they would spar together. But on the other hand, he had about a 13 year age gap on his brother, so it's likely that that tipped the scales a little. But if you're looking for an answer as to which style is better, then there's really no need to compare them, since they're both taught by the same organization. At this point, I would like to recommend going out and checking a local dojo if you're interested in the style, but unless you live in Japan, it seems like your options are hugely limited. If you live in North America, like I do, then your only official options are both in Canada. The first link in my sources is the official Motobu Ryu organization's website, so you can go there if you want to see if you can find a sanctioned dojo near you, or if you just want to learn more about the style. Or you can always send them a nice email and see if there's anybody nearby who you could study with. Thanks so much for watching this way too long and way too overdue video. With this one, I really just wanted to make sure that more people knew about a very interesting style that I feel often gets overlooked as well as, you know, ride the trend a little bit. If you liked this video, you know what to do. If you enjoyed this video so much that you want to see more of my stuff, then you can subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications so that you know when the next one comes out. I've been the Goju-Do Philosopher, but even so, I've gotta say, practice Naihanchi.